Today, as I said, 300 years later, however, we have perfect roads and telecommunications up the yin-yang and the same lumbering 18th century representative system that no longer represents the electorate because the electorate is no longer an out-of-touch out bunch of illiterate peasants. And as for political choice, if Baskin Robbins only offered two or three, they'd be out of business. Representative democracy and any other form of intermediary infrastructure, and that's pretty much every social and business organization, and the, the, the reductionist top-down silo thinking oversimplified command structure that comes with that won't work well enough or fast enough or efficiently enough in a world where universal access and knowledge webbing and technologies like the brain will be generally available for the first time in history. But as I said, the major benefit offered to the community as well as to the world of specialists by knowledge webs might be to make prediction easier. And after all, what's the purpose of knowledge if not prediction? In my case, so as to encourage high schoolers to think a bit more predictively, I've put a couple of three small historical examples into this knowledge web of the kind of capabilities that the approach might offer. Say, for instance, if I can find it, say, for instance, you are you are back in the 18th century and you are good, I found it. You're XYZ Weaving Incorporated, okay? And your key supplier is a guy called Arkwright. He makes looms, right? So here's Arkwright. And here is Arkwright's pals and prime contact and so on. Now, interestingly, what you do is you, you do what modern-day terrorist trackers do. You, you put up the web and you look for anomalies, something that doesn't fit. Everybody in this web is to do with Arkwright's business in one form or another, except this guy. He's a chemist, and he works at Glasgow University. So what's the link? Why is Arkwright talking to him? Well, you look at that. By the way, this information is coming in from your guys and your business, and they're out there you know, sending in updates maybe once a week, since it's parchment and <laughs> link. Um, on who's talking to who out there in the business. To whom, sorry. So here is Arkwright talking to Black, and you ask why, and you take a look, and you discover that he's talking to Black, because one of the things Black is doing is helping a mechanic at the university work out how to repair an inefficient, old-fashioned kind of steam engine. His name is Watt, and what he's about to unleash is the Industrial Revolution. So with this kind of brain approach, webbing approach, you might have better predicted what was coming and innovated XYZ weavers to prepare for it. Now, put this down again. The, the great 18th century French mathematician Pierre Simon Laplace once said, look, you want me to predict everything? Fine, tell me everything. You think about the kind of techniques we're going to have soon and you see that with data mining and electronic agents and stuff like the brain, we're going to be close to what Laplace was talking about possibly within your lifetime with the ability to know what's going on at the science, technology, social interface, and to predict outcomes across a range and at a level of detail, orders of magnitude greater than ever before, and what, that, what we might be able to do with that could, as I hope to show in a minute, change the nature of innovation itself. One other aspect of knowledge webbing is also the way in which the technique makes it easy to cross over into other knowledge webs, other disciplines, other industries, other cultures, other economies, because almost any area of a knowledge web has one or more gateways to go through into that other web and through that to get a handle on how that other economy or culture might change your life, your working life, for instance, or anything else. That capability to, to web your circumstance through into other webs in itself might over time on a very much larger scale make it possible for companies and governments to deal in timely fashion with the developing and changing demands of the rising consumer class of the emerging threat economies once our outsourcing to them has helped to kickstart areas of their economies and fuel their domestic growth and in turn boosted demand for the high-end consumer goods and services that we would then, using our predictive abilities, be ready to provide. Fine, if that were, were to happen, except of course in the long run after that, we're still left with the question inevitably, as the software spreads, you know, as the Chinese get to have the brain and the global playing field is finally level, how will we keep our markets, our jobs, and our standards of living? Well, I think most people agree that the diminishing Western support for pure research needs to be reversed because ultimately that's where entirely new markets have been created in the past 
a couple of examples. In the 19th century, people laughed at Scottish uh, physicist James Dewar for keeping a soap bubble inflated for three years. But the end result of Dewar's obsession with surface tension was string film and the entire packaging industry. Around 1900, a fellow called Arnold Sommerfeld is bouncing x-rays off a crystal to see what happens when you do that. He's noodling away, and at least two things occur. The x-rays create patterns on, on a, a piece of film behind the crystal that tells you about the crystal's uh, structure, and 50 years later reveals the DNA double helix, and then triggers the entire genetics industry. 80 years after the same Sommerfeld persuasion, Another outcome of the work puts the F-117 in the air and kicks off stealth technology. Now, the negative reaction to, to funding long-term blue sky uh, pure research like this is often expressed as, what use is it? Um, but as Benjamin Franklin once said, when somebody said about these new 18th century hot air balloons the Montgolfiers were using, he said, well, what on earth use are they? And, and, and Benjamin Franklin said, what use is a newborn baby? So, put together pure research with uh, knowledge webs and data mining and electronic agents, and you have another intriguing possibility with regard to keeping up in the innovation economy. You might be able to change the nature of innovation by going beyond innovation to some kind of innovation template. Now, I say this because back in the 1940s, this guy, uh, the great American mathematician Norbert Wiener, said, change comes most of all from the unvisited no man's land that lies between the disciplines. I would add where reductionism doesn't usually go. Knowledge webbing makes available and accessible the no man's land between different fields and encourages cross-discipline collaboration. That's its job. So could it be that knowledge webbing might encourage interdisciplinary initiatives that would be able to break out of the old silos, more readily cross the barriers between one area of expertise and another, make redundant the old reductionist turf wars that prevent different areas of endeavor from sharing what they know. This is no risky new exercise. I mean, we did it before, but back in the past we did it by accident. I mean, early in the 20th century, the no man's land between physics and botany uh, spawned molecular biology. From between artillery shell trajectory calculation and uh, cosmic ray counting came this thing, uh, ENIAC, the computer. But those things happened in a relatively empty and slow-moving world. Today, there is no time anymore for the serendipitous effect. The, the effects of change are now so complex and so interactive and global, I think about subprime, that we can no longer afford to leave innovation to accidents or circumstances. And in some areas, we've done something about that. I mean, prophylactic measures have been taken up in environmental issues, uh, in medicine, uh, in, in health and safety. But with advanced predictive ability, we might soon be in a position to make accurate forecasts as part of a new approach you might describe as innovation ecology. Crude, that, I'm sorry. But, I mean, using large-scale knowledge webbing to predict areas of likely innovation and their social and industrial and economic ripple effects far enough ahead in time to, for the community to take steps, either to encourage or discourage or modify their development. Now, I can't say what future no man's land interdisciplinary innovations are likely to be over the next decades, because I'm not Laplace, and I haven't built the webs to do it, but the webs are likely to be built. Uh, if they were being built today, they might concentrate on what may come out of no man's land areas bumping into each other, like uh, the interactions that may come from what I've heard described as nano neuro bio info and all the other disciplines at present locked up in in fields of isolated research silos across the globe. Now, don't get me wrong in all this. I'm not advocating some already discredited, centralized form of government control over innovation. I mean, that approach only ever worked in the world of the past, where people lived under um, mushroom management governance, you know, keep them in the dark and feed them a load of manure. But, but with predictive access and virtual testing environments and agent-mediated direct social and political involvement by every member of a, of, a, of a community educated using um, te technologies like the brain, we might be able to reorganize and make transparent institutions of all kinds, go beyond leaving social decisions to the grossly oversimple view of so-called leaders, go beyond the crude win-or-die strategies of the marketplace, and above all, perhaps, go beyond the old idea, the oldest one of all, that innovation only happens 
with specialist knowledge on a big scale with big bucks. Today, thanks to technologies like the brain, we're beginning to produce a kind of software to facilitate collaborative, innovative thinking at every level, all the way down to the garage. The place where innovation revolutions start may no longer be limited to the great city centers or large industrial labs. It may start in the massively complex engine between people's ears if we had the information technology back up to make the necessary connections. Well, it's likely we soon will have. Now, all along, I'm nearly finished. I've been talking about most of the people I would consider my audience, the great majority of the population, enfranch disfranchised by crude, one-size-fits-all educational and training systems built, if you think about it, in times of technological shortfall, that's the entire past, to keep the majority out because there's no way you could employ the majority if you let them in. Thanks to which the tremendous mass of potential talent in those 303,083,444 American brains has so far been denied us because just to get involved up to now you had to have a reductionist silo thinking PhD. With the kind of technology coming soon to a brain near you, that may no longer be entirely true. Once everybody's hundred billion neurons have the means to get in the game. And the best thing about this approach is that while it might help to power the high rates of innovation we will need if we are to compete in the global marketplace, it might also give us the tools with which to handle the ripple effects I discussed before. Perhaps because it might also generate the kind of job description we haven't seen since the 15th century. The kind of person we used to call the Renaissance man, the guy who knew everything there was to know. This time around, of course, the Renaissance person won't know everything, but they'll know how to know what's needed whenever it's needed. How to take the synoptic view of how everything is connecting and interacting from the overall level of general trends to the smallest zoomed-in detail. We may call these new Renaissance people by a new name that up to now has been used almost as an insult. We may call them generalists. Now, getting to this, I don't think, will be a smooth ride. I mean, after all, we still live in a world made up of organizations that go back variously from 300 years to the caves, social and scientific and business structures created in the past with the technology of the past, to solve the problems of the past. Established power structures and vested interests of all kinds involved in those organizations will not want to give up control they've had so far in a world that's always been one where the few order and the many obey. It won't then be a smooth ride. It might well turn out to be a bit of a free-for-all, but it may also be the first free-for-all in history. So thanks to the work going on above all in areas like thebrain.com, we may finally be coming to the end of that culture of scarcity I mentioned earlier, in which we could only have vertical command structures, centralized representative political processes constrained by four-year electoral horizons, one-size-fits-all educational training systems that define you as intelligent or stupid when you passed or failed a limited set of tests originally developed for the 17th century, silo-restricted reductionist research, and above all, in terms of what matters to my audience, the view that specialist knowledge is the only knowledge worth having and the only proof of intelligence. None of what has happened so far in history, I think, has prepared any of us for the reality of what is coming socially after scarcity ends and the culture of information abundance begins. So part of my work is to get the audience to think about the more general questions this situation is about to throw up. I mean, a couple of questions in no particular order. If information technology is beginning to bypass the social infrastructures and generate a massive disconnect between people and their institutions as people discover stuff about how the institutions have always worked that they never knew about before but don't yet have the tools to do anything about, are people being left primarily with a feeling of frustration and impotence? As information and communications technology make smaller and smaller social groupings viable and economically autonomous, will we see the end of the nation state? And how will the breakup proceed? Does Kosovo set the pattern for California and Texas? If the investigation of the scientific no man's land reveals, for instance, how to use, I don't know, the molecular building potential of nanotechnology, say, to bring the end of resource scarcity, because one day with nanotechnology you'll be able to make anything you need, and if our entire world history has been one of seeking access to resources by means of war, if necessary, think recent, 
what will resource abundance do to the present geopolitical balance when if you want something, you just make it? When the technology is capable of doing all the nuts and bolts, we tell it to without further human intervention, will the ultimate trading commodity no longer be goods and services, but ideas? And how will that shift the balance of power between the at present rich and at present poor countries? When we can offer every brain a personally tailored knowledge web-based education, what about the one-size-fits-all tests we used to give to ensure standards? If the electronic agent-mediated 24-7 direct participatory democracy of the late 21st century comes, how will we handle the here-today, gone-tomorrow roller coaster political situation that may result? I mean, how does pragmatic, non-ideological politics work? As universal access offers everybody the means of self-expression, are we about to face a deluge of mediocrity in the arts, the like of which has never been seen before? I think we are beginning to see that already. In the long term, will it be necessary to know anything, in the old memorized sense of the word, in a world where what we know today will almost certainly be obsolete tomorrow? And in such a world, what would the constant be? As the rate of acceleration of information and change accelerates way beyond what our present obsolete, backward-looking institutions can manage, do we face several generations of local and global turbulence, social turbulence, while we adapt our infrastructures to fit? Is Islamic fundamentalism, for example, only the first example? If questions like these induce a desire in you to jump out of the window, part of my mandate is usually to offer my audience comfort from the fact that it has all happened before. That's what historians say. But in this case, what you're looking at now, printed books, changed everything as well, once upon a time. I mean, back then, people were just as apprehensive about the future they saw coming down the road. As somebody said back in the 15th century, in an eerie pre-echo of today's concern over dumbing down, this new printing press, they said, will make reading the dangerous infatuation of people who have no business reading. As I said this time round, the answers to questions like the ones I listed earlier will come probably from the bottom up rather than be imposed from the top down. If, that is, those uh, 303 million, 83,444 brains and the billions of others around the world are given the means to express their opinions and access, easy access, to the data they need in order to have those opinions. In other words, if we have found a way to bring them in from the cold so that we can then transition to the kind of social construct, perhaps, that the world of the first printed book perhaps even the world of the first American founding fathers would have called mob rule. The change to that will have to come from the bottom up because the present dysfunctional social institutions, the dictatorships, the corrupt hierarchies, the incompetent bureaucracies, the vested interests, none of them will conspire at their own demise. I believe there is a profoundly democratic base to the new information technology that can act. To manage the radical changes, we need at this transitional point. If we succeed, then if nothing else, we may at least have saved ourselves from going on living the way we have up to now through history, handling change by the skyscraper effect, the approach that so many corporations and social institutions still still seem to prefer, you know, illustrated by the man who falls off the top of a skyscraper. As he's falling past the 77th floor, somebody calls out to ask him how he's doing, and by now falling past the 55th floor, the man shrugs his shoulders and says, Hey, so far so good. That's it. Thank you, James. Uh, that uh, was uh, fascinating and uh, certainly generated a uh, number of questions uh, oh from from the audience. Uh, uh, very positive feedback throughout the session. So I'm going to jump into Q&A and kind of start at the, the top uh, as you started pre uh, presenting. The first question is from Todd Lapine. And I'm just going to go ahead and read that. And that is, what do you think of the idea of collective intelligence or wisdom of the crowd on the Internet vis-a-vis uh, -vis Wikipedia, Facebook, etc., for creating the fertile ground for emergent phenomenon, and do you see the internet itself as an emergent, fractal, biological nervous system? Well, I'm not and sure I can use all those words in relation to it, Todd, but I think, <laughs> yes, I mean, as I said, as I said later in my talk, um, I think that what this, this technology encourages are what we used to call um, uh, 
unconnected people, people who don't have the expertise, people who haven't got a PhD in the subject. But, uh, but I think it's what this technology permits is for us to, to, to give new uh, freshness, above all by giving a, giving a tool to the kind of experience that is often as valuable as the specialist knowledge itself. I mean, this is a bad example, and somebody will jump down my throat, I'm sure. But I mean, you know, it takes highly, a highly specialized skill to build a bridge across a river. It takes an entirely different kind of skill, which I would describe more as experience, to ask the kinds of questions about the bridge being there, its effect on the local community, its effect on the environment, uh, the reason why you wanted a bridge in the first place, what kind of people had come up with a suggestion that the bridge should be built. So there are kind of two wholly different areas there in which, yes, specialist skills, of course, are essential. I'm not saying that the brain.com replaces the need for specialist study, far from it, but that they run, par they run parallel. So yes, what I'm saying is that in, a, in, in the sense that you're saying it, um, that these technologies uh, will greatly enhance the opportunity for us to have collaborative intelligence. Um, uh, I don't want to make a particular comment about Wikipedia, but but one of one of Wikipedia's great strengths is that when you have the means to to to, to make it accessible, when you know anybody can come along and have their say, um, out of a lot of a lot of a lot of um, sometimes chaotic and, in, 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 and in, inaccurate material, you get something which is ultimately of profound importance. So yes, and I think the internet, this is perhaps the most important thing the internet is going to provide for us. Okay, great. And uh, we have a question from Ian Clayton. Are there any plans or thoughts to integrate the K-Web with Google's null endeavor, which is some see as a Wikipedia killer? I, I, as I said earlier, would like to see the K-Web become the, the, the monster at New York. I mean, I see no reason why, why all these artifacts should not be joined. Um, whether I, you know, whether I, my K-Web is subsumed into theirs or they are subsumed into a K-Web is of no importance to me. I just want the stuff to get out. And so, I, I'm, I'm happy to see these various um, tools developing because, you know, everyone's moving and we're all moving in the same direction. So I would see it as a great opportunity to, to, as I said, you know, use one of the gateways in my knowledge web to, together with one of the gateways in one of the other entities to bring us together. I mean, it's going to happen whether we like it or not. Right. And uh, James, a lot of our participants have been asking how they uh, can contact you or your staff with ideas and offers to help with the beta, Wonderful. help build the K-Web. That's very kind. Thank you. Um, the thing to do is go to the K website, which is k-web.org, O-R-G, and probably he hates me for saying this, but make trouble for Patrick McCurcher, who's the project manager. Patrick McCurcher, M-C-K-E-R-C-H-E-R. -E -E uh, he's in California, and he's, uh, he's really good at it, and he'll point you in the right direction or, or point you at me if, if well, he'll point you at whoever, whoever, need, whoever you need. And yes, we would appreciate all and any help. Uh, research on the biogs and the materials themselves, ideas for where we should be going with the web other than just school. And above all, sorry, but you know, I'm like one of those elect, one of those politicians I criticize. I have this short term requirement at the moment that we get the, 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 the UE built, uh, done. So uh, if you're the guy out there with those skills and you have the time and the desire, um, you know, we'll probably erect a statue to you. Thank you. And just to add to that, um, Patrick McCursher, uh, the email address that he gave us for our press release for volunteers is pat, P-A-T-13, at dslextreme.com. And again, if any of you do need to uh, get a hold of Patrick, uh, feel free to email me as well, and I'll put you in touch with him. And by all means, you know, bother Shelley if you want to come direct to me. And if you don't mind, Shelley, you can, you can feel the stuff. Absolutely. And uh, we have a question from, uh, or a comment from Fernando uh, James. He said he was introduced to the Brain Bayou dur during a presentation that you gave in Rice University at 2000, and he has not stopped using, using the personal brain since I'm then. I'm so pleased. Good, good. Yeah, I enjoyed that day at Rice. More people turned up than we thought was going to turn up. It was, it was a good day. Thank you very much. 
Okay, and we have a question from Heather. Um, in terms of, uh, from a writer perspective, because you are so prolific in your writing, um, do you use the brain to write, or is it uh, basically the research that you do contained with the connections and then write about those? What is uh, write about those? What is your process for uh, writing connections in, in conjunction with your use of, of personal brain? Well, I, I, I what I do is um, first of all, I, I decide you know, what, what the idea for the book or whatever it is is, and that comes out of your head, I'm afraid. And then I, I use the brain to kind of write down and link every aspect that I think would matter. And then I look at that pattern, I look at the, the brain and I say, yeah, okay, looking at the pattern reveals more holes, more potential links, more ideas come as you watch that structure, and the structure grows. And when I think I've got enough to start research, then that's the real problem. Then I go and do the research and discover that most of it is wrong. <laughs> you know, that what I'd fondly imagined would be possible isn't. But that gives you other ideas in turn. And then what happens is a period of, oh, probably a, for a book, about three months interaction in the library between the research and the structure as, as I've um, formalized it using the brain. And all the time what's happening is the brain's getting more dense, more structured and so on. And then essentially what I do is I go through what I think would be the primary pathways, which would be, as it were, each chapter, and I make sure that they work using primarily the brain. And at that point then I start the real research and then you have, I don't know, a year and a half usually in the library um, uh, getting the raw material with which to write the material, with which to write the, the narrative. So the brain interacts, as it were, with uh, my head. But, um, that's what it's for. I and think. James, just to add to that question, what uh, what was your what did your brain look like, uh, you know, three years ago, and how has it evolved? When you think back to when you first started the personal brain, did you have a particular philosopher or, an invent or inventor that you started with? Did you start with Descartes, or did you jump right into Voltaire? How did that process unfold? Well, I guess it starts. It starts way, sorry, Shelley, but way before the brain. Um, of when course. I, when, when, I made a pro, <laughs> when I made a program called Connections back in the 70s, and I, 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 it started actually with a stirrup. Um, I, I, when I had the idea for Connections, I got it because I was reading a book by a wonderful man, the last now dead, uh, called Lynn White, who was uh, the emeritus, even then emeritus professor of uh, history at UCLA. And a wonderful man. And um, I read this footnote about uh, how it might have been possible that the introduction of the stirrup had also generated the, s the social structure known as feudalism, because with shock troops, you could probably you know, fight your way through most mobs. So the bigger the horse, the harder you hit. And therefore, what we needed would be a number of ranches in order to rear these giant horses. And so land would be expropriated from the church, and people would be put in charge of these ranches called Dutch ducks leaders or branch branch chiefs became known as dukes and uh, they would then grow these big horses and the people who would ride them and these guys then uh, were rather specialist people and they'd ride these horses the bigger they got the more they realized they needed protection so they put on a armor to protect themselves then nobody knew who they were so they put who they were you know charlie smith or whatever on a shield and there you have the beginning of of the whole heraldry thing well i, I was i was really taken with this idea and here i am a callow youth you know and i <laughs> I call this amazingly august man, and I say, Professor, would you mind if I use this idea because I think it, it, it gives me an idea for approaching the whole of history like this? And he said, I've never forgotten this, and I would pass it on to anybody, any time. It's terribly important. He said, young man, I stole it. You steal it. And I said, you stole the idea, Professor? And he said, this is a quote, he said, you don't think we're born with ideas, do you? <laughs> And so I went away, and so that's where I started. I started with the link between uh, the syrup and, and the shield, because the shield is a particular shape, a kite-shaped shield, which is the kind of shield you need to protect the whole of your left side when your right arm is entirely busy holding a lance, so you can't fight anybody off, so you use the shield to protect your, your body. And that's why we know that they were using stirrups and sitting on those horses, because the shape of the shield changed. So anyway, that, that's how it began. And then it grew. Um, the great thing about these things, and the great thing about using the brain is it grows by itself. I mean, it grows because you suddenly think, hey, and you add something. Later on, you find it doesn't work, you take it out. But it encourages this 
it encourages, it seems to me, this kind of thinking is what the brain is for, and it's what, and I don't mean to be rude to teachers because I know, look, we need to teach people to be specialists because I wouldn't let anybody inside my body unless he was a qualified surgeon or she was a qualified surgeon. So, of course, we need specialists. But um, I remember getting low marks at school for years and years because the guy said, you've got, you know, you've got a brain like a grasshopper. But the great thing is the brain is like a grasshopper, and it's only with technology like the brain, the brain.com, that you have a tool that can allow you to give complete, total reign to your grasshopperness and still stay anchored. Interesting. And uh, just on that note, uh, Ian Clayton had a sort of question comment about uh, we shall need a program to educate those and who are comfortable with silos. How can they ad adapt? And he says uh, he thinks this will frighten the bejeevers out of many teachers, uh, but sees the possibilities. Uh, how can we sort of transition from this uh, reductionist mode to the uh, the connective world that you describe? What right. suggestions do you have for bringing that to a classroom, yes. uh, to yes. our businesses? Okay. Well, I just want to poison the well. You see. So, wh what I what I would say is, first of all. I, I um, most of the silo people, and I've had contact with thousands of them over my career, are nervous because if you spend your entire life in a highly detailed area of expertise, you're not that comfortable being being asked to link it to anything else. In fact, quite often early in my career, I'd be, ring up somebody and say something, and they'd say, "Why do you want to know this?" And I'd say, "Oh, because of Mozart." And they'd say, "Mozart? What's that got to do with?" So. There's that slight nervousness that you... But, but again, as I said, the, the, something like the brain.com or connective thinking in general doesn't damage or, or endanger the position of the specialist uh, at all. It, it, in a sense, it enhances it because it allows people to make contact with that area of thought where previously they might not have been able to or had the nerve to. The thing about scaring the bejesus out of teachers, yes, yes, I've had, that. I've had lots of that reaction. But I, I, one is at pains to say, look... Nobody is suggesting for a minute that the, the brain.com version, the knowledge web, is there to replace what people do in school. Far from it. I mean, as I said, you still need, I mean, you know, nobody wants to fly from A to B in an airplane designed by some guy who never went near aerodynamics or even mathematics. Of course not. Of course not. The world functions. The mechanism of the world functions. I'm interested in getting people only <coughs> to to think contextually about this speci these specialist areas of knowledge, to be constantly aware that what it is they know about aerodynamics or, or endocrinology or whatever has r social ramifications that are more easily understood if you use this connective type of thinking. So m one's prime aim is not to go into the school and say, right, this is a great sweeping revolution. You will throw out all subjects and you will bring in the brain. No, no, no. I think the brain should be used as a kind of mental equivalent of the day in which the school does sports. So that, you know, now and again, maybe once every two or three days, or maybe even once a week, or maybe once a day if you feel like it, you have a small period of time devoted to playing games with webbed thinking, with the brain.com type thinking. And then you say, okay guys, you've had your fun, now let's get back to our serious subject. But what you've done is change, possibly, some of the ways in which those guys think about the subject. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's, I mean, they still have to learn calculus um, uh, to pass whatever exam they need to pass to be whatever they want to be. Um, but it, but, but I think this contextual nature of what is conferred on them when they think like this enriches the experience. Um, I do recognise in many teachers of my friends of mine who are teachers who say, and this is a problem also brought up, you know, from time to time with other such structures. You know, how on earth do we grade people when they come back with stuff we haven't had a moment to look at? I mean, you know, this little thing I've built, 2,800 nodes, 30,000 possible links. Well, I mean, the number, of, the number of pathways you can take through that tiny web is vastly greater than any teacher could ever possibly be qualified to make a comment about, unless they follow the pathway you took. Well, they can't because 30 kids in a class come in with 30 different storylines. How do you test, how do you grade those storylines in that case? And that seems to me to be the root of the problem for the many of the teachers who have expressed their fears about this. 
And my answer is, you don't. You don't. You, you first of all, you, maybe you keep it separate from, of course you keep it separate from the exam system that gets people to go to university or gets them a high school diploma. You keep it separately as a kind of adjunct remark upon a person's abilities, and I think a very valuable one, in that, as I said during my talk there, what you do is you say, not so much does a person know the right or wrong answer in order to become a chemist, but why, what kind of pathways did they take through the web? Why, when they got to James Watt, here's James Watt sitting on my screen now, you know, well, some, one kind of guy will say, well, I'm going to try to go from Watt to, to the motor car. And an entirely different kind of guy is going to say, I wonder if there's a link between Watt and ice cream. And these these journeys will be so individually creative while still attached to data that the teacher, I think, would be able to see the kinds of almost assessment of a person's creative abilities uh, as well as their intellectual abilities. And I don't think there's any easy tool that a teacher can use today to do that, but I think this represents such a tool. They're all going to shoot me for saying that. Great. And James, while you have your brain up, we have a question from Fernando about asking you if you can comment on your use of jumps and what criteria you use to make the choice. And I'll just add to that. So when you're creating this brain, you've got some, some people and ideas below as, as children, some as parents above. What, how do the, what, what do these relationships represent? OK. First of all, um, uh, Shelley, because I use three, I avoid the parent-child relationship. You'll see from this version, this, this is three, that you don't see such things. You simply see, I suppose, yeah, parent-child in the sense that what links to people and they link to others. Mm -hmm. um, but the, how do I choose? I don't choose in the sense they choose themselves. I mean, my, my prime aim is as ultimately, I suppose, a, sh a charlatan and entertainer. I mean, my prime aim is to keep the users and the audience and the, the readers with me, because if they go away, they're not watching the show, they're not reading the book, whatever. And also because I think history moves in maverick ways. I mean, you know, you walk out the front door tomorrow morning and you turn left. If you turn right, your, your world will be, your life will be different. In some way, maybe totally unimportant, infinitesimally small that you may never notice, but your life will be different because you turn right, and even, even if all that happens for the rest of your life is you see somebody that you never would have seen if you turned left. So every action um, leads to serendipitously to different things that make up what it is you are and what your life is. And what, I try, what I'm trying to do with this is to replicate the same kind of thing. So when I'm reading about James Watt, sure, I'm reading about the standard stuff. You know, James Watt worked with Black, and uh, Black told him all about um, um, the, uh, the separate condenser, you know, if you put the cylinder under cold water, uh, you know, all that stuff. Um, and, and all the kind of stuff you might learn in a history of science or technology. And what's linked with all the other scientists in his life um, in, uh, at the time, and the industrialists who wanted to use his engines and blah, blah, blah. But now and again, uh, during the reading, you come across a link that, it, that it seems quite maverick. And I always include it. Because what I want people to do is to look at uh, these, these maps, these, these uh, brains, each page, and say, oh yeah, here's what ho-hum, you know, why is he talking to this guy? Or why is there a link? Because it doesn't look right. You know, it's like, um, uh, well, I mean, almost anywhere. So what I'm doing as I'm reading about these people is, A, getting ready for their biography, which will be, you know, uh, 1,000 words of what seems to be a definitive view of who they were and what they did. But that includes among their connections some unexpected people. And it's the unexpected that I like because it's not hierarchical and it doesn't happen in knowledge trees. It happens with brain.com. End of commercial. Very interesting. And uh, just to add to that, um, and sort of your, your, your methods of linking, uh, Brad Schneider had a question about possibly combining brains. Uh, would, how would you propose to reconcile, and, and perhaps maybe you wouldn't, what, what we might think is a linkage between two thoughts and what you might think is a linkage? And who's going to decide, what is that process for the K-Web? Is it your vision and your research, or at some point does it get 
get turned over to the users and are they defining the links and the connections? Well, certainly eventually it will be turned over to the users whether I like it or not. Um, because soon, soon enough, uh, when Shelley has her way, <laughs> they'll all have their own personal brains and they'll all be able to build their own webs. And at some point, if you build your own web large enough, you will bump into my web, whether you like it or not. You may bump into my personal web, or you may bump into the knowledge web, or you may bump into a web that's generated by people on Wikipedia. You'll bump into other webs. Um, at some point, there will be a connection which is entirely valid. Um, what I think is difficult, and this is why I like the maverick, the serendipitous nature of building these webs, what is difficult to do is to, is to deliberately choose a kind of, uh, to link two things together when when the other end of the link might not agree. I don't think you have to worry about that because sooner or later links will occur uh, that do work. Um, all you need to do is to build the web big enough. Um, I can't really, I'm sorry I'm not really handling this question very well because I'm trying to work out what, it, what the question might mean um, in the sense that um, if, if a web were built that had no link whatsoever to the knowledge web, then it wouldn't link. But the matter of trying to make it link, I think, would be fairly simple. Because what I think you do is you find, uh, I was going to say you find cognate things. You find things that seem to be close together, although they don't link directly, and read in widening circles until you find links. Well, ah, well, well I, I do it every time I write a book. Let me tell you, for example, the way I, the last book I wrote, American Connections, they're all the same. I'm a one-trick pony. But what I did was, I, the, the, the aim was to start the book with one of the signs of the Declaration of Independence and end each chapter with the same name in the modern world. Not linked to this person, because in many cases their line died out. But anyway, I mean, for example, um, uh, John Hancock. Uh, in, there's John Hancock and blah, 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 and at the end, uh, I find somebody called Hancock who works in, I think, North Carolina as a radio show host. So the technique is to follow serendipitous links from forward through time from John Hancock. Um, and those are, you know, the usual thing. You read about John Hancock in increasingly uh, widening circles until you find something quite unexpected and use that deliberately because it's the cliffhanger that keeps the attention of the reader. Uh, so you don't, you know, you don't just do John Hancock and he knew everybody in Boston. You try to find a link that will surprise people, and they'll say, hey, that's funny, I wonder why, and go on reading. Anyway, so you do that until you get to, I don't know, somewhere around the, the 19th century, middle of the 19th century somewhere. And now there are a couple of rules. I mean, one rule, for example, is that a chapter isn't going to contain really more than about 20 people, because, because if the publisher says you can only have enough paper for a book lasting 120,000 words, then each chapter is only con going to contain so many words. And, you know, you've got to say so many words about a person, otherwise people will feel they're being shortchanged, or you simply won't be able to say enough anyway to make them meaningful. So you know that you're going to have about 20 people in a chapter. So by the middle of the 19th century, from John Hancock, you've arrived at some guy or woman uh, in the middle of the 19th century, and fine, stop there. Then go to the end, to the modern world, and use the Internet, because that's the easiest way to do it, to try and track down somebody of the same name. Having chosen that person, you then go backwards from them. And you go backwards using exactly the same techniques. Uh, the particular gentleman I'm talking about in, uh, in the radio world won a prize at one point for his laudable efforts on behalf of the Bone Marrow Drive. Uh, and Bone Marrow Drive uh, was on behalf of some people uh, who had been organized and set up by Admiral Zumwalt, the, the, um, the US Admiral. And you go back from Admiral Zumwalt. Now, at some point, you get back to the 19th century but you don't get back to where you had arrived when you came from John Hancock. So it's like a bridge, you know, that's being built by people who can't build, so they come across the middle and they don't meet. Well, what you do is you read in widening circles. You know, it's interesting, one of the ways that the ner nerves in the brain seem to grow in, 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 ba in babies um, are that they, they're supposed to go from here to here and make linkages, and they, what they do is they throw out processes in all directions until one of them makes contact. So I do the same kind of thing. I, I get to each end of my forward moving and backward moving line. I've given myself probably a sort of 20 or 30 year period here. And I read in widening circles around these people. And sooner or later, there's a link. It may be two links. It may even be three that will do it. But sooner or later, it happens. Um, it's jolly hard to live in the same period 
in a in a world where there are very few people who are literary and moving and and connected and empowered, um, without being able to link two people as Kevin Bacon did, you know, within what is it, six six degrees. So that's how it's done, and that's how I think these work. Anyway, look, that's a very long answer to a, a question. Sorry. Very interesting. And then, uh, kind of to follow that, uh, uh, Cora has a question about um, whether or not it's valuable as part of the web construction to assess the quality of the links and connections. Uh, for example, the connection between Santa Ana and uh, Robert Owen in your chewing gum example. Or um, do you, are you going to add, or would you find it necessary to add a strong versus weak link connection, or to start waiting? Or uh, you mentioned the, the use of labels in, in a future version for your links. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Cora. I'm, I'm not sure that uh, this particular web. I'm, in, I'm interested in strong or weak connections. I mean, uh, one of the things about the web is that you would have um, Santa Ana and his link to. Uh, to Owen, Santa Ana has a number of other connections. Let me find him again here, Santa Ana. Um, here's Santa Ana, and you see that Robert Owen is only one of his connections. Um, there are a number of others, which are, I suppose, historically, in terms of his Im immediate impact on the world of the time, stronger, and Owen might be a weaker. Nonetheless, Santa Anna interacted with Owen on a matter of some importance because Owen was not able to do what he wanted to do. And Owen himself, you know, was a major player in the liberalization of, you know, raw early 19th century capitalism. In, I mean, Owen was a guy who, you know, let his little, said he wouldn't employ a child younger than 10, and he actually changed their bedding once a week, and they actually washed themselves, and they actually went and learned something in a school in his factory, you know, kind of for an hour every year. Well, better, better than that. So, you know, Owen himself is quite a man. I mean, look at, look at, Owen's, look at Owen's linkages. I mean, he, this, is, this is kind of mover and shaker. So the fact that, that Owen and Santa Anna meet in terms of each man's life may, in the old reductionist sense of the word, not be um, at the core of what you would do when you represented those two guys' lives. But they interacted in a way that was meaningful and had a powerful effect on, on history even if it's only chewing gum. But I shouldn't say even if it's only chewing gum, because if you work for a chewing gum factory, it's your livelihood. Uh, so let's not knock chewing gum. So what I'm saying is it's very difficult to, to make decisions about... There's a problem about deciding of strong and weak, as opposed to, in my case, accepting grab all. And, you know, if it's fun, do it. The trouble about strong and weak is that, you know, one man's meat is another man's poison. Uh, who decides strong and who decides weak? And if you go into the world of the specialist historians, you'll find that, you know, two historians have three opinions. I mean, it's very difficult that everybody agree on what is strong and weak. So I, like all cowards, I evade the issue. Okay, and we have a question from Jeff. Who are some of your heroes? Oh, oh difficult. Shannon, of course, information theory. Norbert Wiener, I mentioned, the man who who thought up this concept of no man's land. And Wiener is the guy who invented cybernetics, by the way. He's, he put together a, a radar signal to an algorithm so that you could shoot a shell at, a, at the air where a plane would be, or a rocket would be, when the shell got there and blow it up. And uh, thank you, Norbert, he saved England. It was called an M9 predictor. Uh, so Norbert Wiener is one. Uh, um, uh, I, I tend not to have heroes because, of course, my mandate is to try to prove to people that with your 100 billion neurons, you've got a brain just like anybody else's. The thing is that up until now, you know, you didn't get the chance to use it. I mean, people often forget, uh, when one talks about heroes in history and so on, that, w that, you know, it was all 1%, that the vast majority of the population up until only 100 years ago was illiterate. And if you're illiterate, you know, you're pretty much circumscribed in what you can do. And every single one of those illiterates had a brain the same size as mine, yours, or Einstein's. So I'm kind of anti-hero in the sense. And the people I admire and like are the people who did something to share the wealth, I guess. Um, to, I mean, I had, a, I had a great teacher at school, and I guess he's probably the number one, because what he did was he made everybody in his class realize that each one of us had a particular kind of talent that was idiosyncratic to each one of us. And that's what made us special. 
and there's no such thing as a test or you know a, a standard to come up to. You were you were you, and nobody else was you. I remember the very first time, the very first time I spoke in public. I said I expressed my indifference to standing up on the stage, and and this teacher said, "Listen, you're James Burke, and they're not." <laughs> and it it worked ever since. <laughs> anyway. Interesting. And uh, we have a question from Arnold. Um, he notes that uh, he finds it interesting that in much of your writing, you note the random quality of innovation, the bringing together of pre-existing ideas into logical and even illogical conclusions. And he finds it intriguing that you also suggest that this innovation might be able to be predicted and guided by knowledge web. Uh, can you uh, comment more deeply on that and the, yeah, the yes, predictive yes, capability yes, 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 of uh, knowledge webbing? To reconcile predictability with random, yes. Well, I suppose the way I would do that would be to say that, that uh, predictability, that, that using these kinds of skills, these kinds of technologies, to enhance our capability to predict uh, I think is coming and is inevitable and is not at odds with my basic thesis that things happen serendipitously. Um, one of the things that will of course happen is that when you prove that you can predict, the very act of predicting will cause things to happen that could not have happened if you hadn't predicted. So in a sense, your predictability is generating some side dishes, some side orders of unpredictability. That and the fact that the more these tools are made available, the more even applying an innovative template to get some kind of predictability working there, the vast majority of what will be going on will still be incohate, maverick, random, serendipitous. I mean, that's the great exciting thing about this incredible pool of intellectual talent that we have available once we give them the tools. So when I say, you know, predictab predictability in, in, in controlling what we do or do not want to innovate, I'm talking at a very, very crude level. I mean, like, do we want atomic bombs? You know, do we want uh, one kind of chemical or the other on the fields? Do we want, uh, you know, uh, abortion? These are major questions. But behind them, the very tools that provide those predictive capabilities will also be providing the ability to ramp up the products of six billion human brains' capabilities massively. I mean, if, even if all we did was allow those six billion brains to have one thing, you've got six billion more things than you had yesterday. So I'm, I, I don't see that there is a, a contradiction in terms. Interesting. And uh, a, a question from Richard. Um, James, do you see the knowledge web being allowed to expand free of political boundaries and regulations? And do you see any obstacles there? I believe this about about the entire internet. I mean, I believe that, I mean, if not this form of the internet, then the next one. <laughs> I mean, you know, we are to some extent plagued by by commercialism in the present internet. It, I mean, uh, it was very rapidly observed to be a very, very good sales tool. So to some extent, we are suffering from what we've suffered from in other media. But I think the next, the next iterations of the web may find ways around that. Um, so, I think um, I have great faith. I always believe the hacker wins through, um, and I believe that uh, that individuals have never been given a more powerful tool with which to make sure uh, that, uh, that 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 the handcuffs are not put on than ever before. Um, there are just too many people capable of doing too many things now that they have the internet. I think for ultimate, you know, uh, 1984-type uh, Orwellian political control. Uh, there are too many cats out of the bag, and I think the Internet provides the means for thousands and maybe millions of more cats to get out of the bag. Uh, so I, I'm not bothered. I'm an optimist in these matters, also because pessimists jump out of the window and are no longer involved. <laughs>